welcome back to another episode of Behind the Lens. I am film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens, Debbie Elias. You can read my movie reviews and interviews 24-7 in the U.S. and abroad in print and online, particularly on BehindTheLensOnline.net. But every Monday, you will find me right here at Adrenaline Radio, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, live. As a reminder to everybody, uh, the show goes up as a podcast on BehindTheLensOnline.net later today. And then tomorrow it's up on iTunes. You can catch, catch up with all of our almost four years of shows uh, on iTunes. Plus, starting this week, um, Media Circus is going to be syndicating the show uh, on one of its new platforms. So we'll have all that information for you hopefully by next week because I didn't write it down so I could tell you. Uh, so, and we have a real treat today. We're in the studio playing. Our wonderful station owner, Nick Federoff, is here. And he's doing, he's actually playing with lighting and track lighting that he installed, which is why if I look at it, I will go blind, but that's okay. Um, and he's doing a Facebook Live right now, I think. Yes, he's nodding his head. He's not talking. He's nodding his head. But he is actually in the studio with me. Uh, so this is going to be an adventure today. And, uh, of course, Lydia will have an adventure when she gets the SD cards for this show to edit the video. Because it's a whole new lighting <laughs> system that we're playing with. Um, I'm just glad that Nick didn't ask for all my light filters to put on the one light that's standing in the studio. Because we have six different color filters, Nick. Six. Six. I know. You have two. Dot. Oh, you have your eyeballs. That's it. Okay. So, this is this is a day to be lucky because today, behind the lens is all about lucky, and uh, feeling pretty lucky with the special guests that we have that are going to be calling in shortly. Screenwriters Logan Sparks and Drago Samanja, who have written what has turned out to be Harry Dean Stanton's final film. Lucky, directed by John Carroll Lynch. It is a beautiful film. It is a meditation on a life lived, on life itself, uh, addressing being alone versus dying alone. It's a film that relishes the mundane and the quiet moments in life that really are what make it worthwhile. There could not be a more fitting film for Harry Dean Stanton to star in in a lead role as opposed to just being a character actor and to have it wind up being his final film. He plays the character of Lucky who is a 90 year old man and Harry Dean was 89 when he filmed uh, Lucky and he lives in a desert town. The film was shot on location in various desert locales. Uh, very spectacular co-stars Jimmy Darren, yes, Jimmy Darren. And when I last interviewed Jimmy Darren a couple of years ago for a sta for the Stage LA benefit he was going to do, I asked him why he hadn't been acting since Star Trek um, Deep Space Nine and his inimitable character on there that was basically a, a takeoff on Jimmy in, with his uh, cabaret act. Uh, and he said he, the right role just didn't come along. And when the right role came along, he would then go back and, and act. Well, the right role came along uh, as playing one of Lucky's friends. Uh, <clears throat> and a very, a, a very key role that he has also in Lucky. Uh, because he's the guy who has been on the wrong side of the tracks and uh, has spent his life repenting which gets into a lot of metaphor that we see visually and in the story for good and bad, heaven and hell, because obviously when you're 90, um, you're looking at mortality. And that's a big, big portion of the character of Lucky and, his po and this point in his life. Well, before Logan and Drago call in, I want you to hear some of my exclusive interview with, jo interview with John Carroll Lynch from last Sunday. Uh, it was... 
Nick, Nick is sitting here playing, turning, ca turning Facebook phones and things at me. Stop it. Um, John was very, very gracious, as was uh, the wonderful Ariane at Magnolia, who gave me almost 75 minutes with John to talk about the making of Lucky. One of the things that we talked about, though, because John has been a known commodity as an actor for years. Most recently, you saw him in The Founder, American Horror Story, Jackie, Miracles from Heaven, uh, one of my favorites, Volcano, Back to Bubble Boy, The Drew Carey Show, Mercury Rising, a, 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 a rather obscure Bruce Willis film that uh, probably 10 stunt, stunt guys that I've known over the years worked on. But what made Lucky the film that John finally got to step behind the lens, behind the camera, and direct? And this is what he had to say. What made this the film to put you behind the camera? I'd been wanting to direct for a long time, and I tried to leverage myself into the chair on television shows to kind of get it my feet wet. And I'd followed some people, and and uh, and yet they're just never seen. Usually, that that conversation gets really heated for actors in like the third season of a television mm -hmm. show. And as 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 extraordinarily bountiful as my 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 career as an actor has been, I have I have. I have yet to kind of get on a successful television series for three years in a row. Where they'll give you the chance to do yeah, it. Where, where yeah, you're having, where you can wear them down, essentially. You know, you wear them down with, yeah. a, you know, a constant berating, a constant friendly berating of, you know, I really want to do this. And use the, okay, instead of giving me a raise. Yes, yes, if you have to. If you, you have, have to. to. Say, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I'd been with my writing partner for, uh, we've been writing for 13 years and we have lovely screenplays that we've developed, but, but there's, uh, there, the problem with those has been um, producing problems because they require more, their business models require uh, directors of a, a greater stature and also, frankly, as a, as a person who has a very strict uh, mindset as a producer, I wouldn't have called my own number on them wow. as a first-time director because they're far too complicated, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of their, you know, one in terms of style and the other one in terms of just physical capacity. Mm -hmm. You need to have somebody, uh, as well as I know those movies, uh, uh, I think that I could do them now, now that I've, I have some experience, uh, some experiential knowledge doing it, mm -hmm. but there was way too much of an intellectual understanding of what's necessary. Okay. Um, so I... You know, I, I, whenever we talked to anybody, we were talking about directors for those. So I had yet to figure out the story that, you know, I have one now that, that is this scale uh, that my writing partner and I are working on. Uh, that, is, that, that is of, you know, just a slightly more dynamically ambitious mm -hmm. than this one is. I'm just talking about the apparatus. Right. And more story, I guess it would be a terrible way of saying it anyway um it was really the producing aspects of it that were holding me back because i you know as a first-time director you really have to come in with something that's undeniably producible mm -hmm. um and um so the practical nature of this with uh, an actor of such great stature uh harry dean an actor of independent stature of harry dean uh of people like ed begley saying anytime you need me kind of thing you know like Ed was anytime you know just call me I'll find a way to find a day in that period so you had those things going for you and you had a dynamic script a really lovely script that had beautiful density to it that had meaning and power to it um, that could uh, be producible in an independent level mm -hmm. right so all the producing aspects were there okay so why this one as opposed to another one to me it came down to that metaphor of somebody suddenly realizing they're absolutely fine and they're not that that he has this event happen to him and nothing's wrong except that he's going to die and it doesn't let him off the hook mm -hmm. it doesn't give him a, a daughter to go see it doesn't have him rob a bank or a tame a wild horse mm -hmm. any of those things which are all make great movies but it just doesn't do that for him. Mm -hmm. 
it really pushes the stakes of the movie to be absolutely and completely existential. So much so that he has no place to go after this. There's no resurrection. There's no reincarnation. There's none of that. He has no place to go with this truth. And that was, that was what um, the, the screenplay, that's what I wanted to explore. Um, that was the thing that really, that really made it important to me personally, that, that the story be told beyond the, you know, the beautiful, um, you know, artistic ambitions of being able to look down at a call sheet and see Harry Dean Stanton's name at number one for 18 days as a character actor. That felt really good. Mm. And you will have that the rest of your life, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm most grateful for that gift. Uh, And then to add to that, in the other numbers, you know, Beth Grant and Ron Livingston and Tom Skerritt and David Lynch and Ed Begley Jr. and Owen uh, Hugo Armstrong is tremendous in the movie and Yvonne Huffley is great in the film and you know it goes on and on Bertilla Thomas everybody did a wonderful job and um, and I just uh, you know it's a, it, it's a cherished thing I have so many friends who've had an opportunity to direct their first feature and you know they've gotten into Sundance and then you know um, they premiered at 8 and by 11 they're finished you know by 11 Nobody cares about that movie. Yeah. It's gotten reviews that aren't going to be interesting for, for distributors, and they're out the door. So um, to have an experience where um, the movie resonates, the movie has a, a, a response and a reaction that it, that we are able to, to release it theatrically the way the movie was intended to be released, the movie that the intended was to be shown, because it's a throwback movie with a throwback leading mm-hmm. man and, and uh, that it's going to get that release... The only the only real fly in the ointment is that Harry's not going to be able to see it, yeah. and that's a hard one. But what are you going to do? Everybody came for the same reason, focused on the same goal, and uh, and that uh, definitely makes it easier. I've been on movies with with great directors. Uh, I've, I've I've worked with them for short periods of time mm-hmm. and long periods of time, and although. All the ones that seem the most successful are when everybody knows exactly where they are on the rope mm-hmm. and how much they've got to pull and in what direction. And um, and that's true of every single movie I've done um, beyond the ones that are, uh, you know, uh, successful in terms of uh, box office, but the ones that are artistically successful yeah. are the ones that seem to be able to be... Um, Laser focused on what the what the actual movie mm-hmm. is, and that the making of them reflects it. And this always did. Everybody came for the same reason, um, which was to create an opportunity for Harry Dean Stanton to play this part at this time in his life. And for those of you that haven't seen Lucky as yet, and get thee to a theater, because this is the performance of a lifetime for Harry Dean and. I will not be surprised come Oscar nominations morning if we hear a posthumous Oscar nomination for a leading man for Harry Dean Stanton. This is an amazing year with film in that regard. Um, Another icon known pretty much as being character actor, also a leading man, Sam Elliott. Sam, after his performance in The Hero earlier this year, he is another possibility whose name we will hear come Oscar nominations morning. These veterans are, they are at the top of their game. The stars have truly converged this year uh, for some indelible performances. And I I can't encourage you enough. The Hero is now available on DVD, Blu-ray, digital download. If you haven't seen Sam in that, see it. See Harry Dean in Lucky, which is in theaters now. And you heard John talking about the denseness of the story, the beauty. And uh, hopefully we'll have time later in the show. You can hear John and I talk about this, the the very beautiful work done by uh, cinematographer Tim Surstead. But right now, right now, okay, how do I connect the? Can you connect them, Pam? Pam's going to connect them. We have the incredible... 
Logan Sparks and Drago Samandra joining us. Hello, boys. Hello, hey, hello. good morning. I am so thrilled, so lucky to have you guys today. This is this this is a real treat, a real treat. Um, this is such a special film, and it's taken on even more meaning uh, with Harry Dean's passing. Uh, I'm curious. This is a first time screen a screenplay credit for both of you for a feature film. You are no stranger to Harry Dean himself. You, Logan, I know you were an assistant to his for quite a long time. So can you, right. can the two of you talk about how you got together as writing partners, but then what led to tell this story that really comes down to being Harry Dean Stanton, a, a his his life at that particular moment. Well, uh, I'll, I'll I'll lead on this. Drago. Basically, Drago and I had been pals for about fifteen years or so, and uh, he went to um, to Cal Arts, and I went to USC for our undergraduate degrees. But we like to say we got our master's degree at the University of Dan Tannen, <laughs> um, which is a which is a restaurant bar that that's in uh, West Hollywood. It's real old and kind of cretankerous and it's filled with all sorts of legends of different walks of life and uh, that's where I met Drago and I've been Harry's assistant for maybe 15 years uh, and uh, 16 years and up until he passed last last week and uh, we spent a lot of time treading water over at Tana so that's how we became pals and we'd always wanted to work together and we kind of attempted on several occasions but there was nothing really worth you know diving into the deep end with um, and then we went to uh, Arizona for to work on a documentary. We're driving back, and Drago just turned to me and said, why don't we just write what we know? And uh, Drago, you want to take it from there? Uh, yeah, we uh, yeah, the University of Dantanas, I like that, <laughs> where we majored in drinking. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I think yeah, all of we us at some back. point have done that. <laughs> We were uh, we were heading back uh, to Los Angeles, as uh, Logan said, from Arizona, and uh, we just uh, we just thought that this would be a, a, a something really to sort of dive into and uh, a worthy endeavor. So uh, I said I turned to Logan. I just said, you know, let's just you should you know write something with Harry in mind. Put him in the lead. Let's write something simple. Get a bunch of his pals and our pals together and make like a like a homespun film, uh, and uh, we started to sketch out some ideas of what, uh, uh, you know, some uh, of screenplay, what that would look like, and uh, by the time we pulled into Los Angeles, we had a little bit down on paper, and we just promised ourselves that we would meet uh, every day for five, five days a week for a couple hours a day, and just committed to, to just writing, uh, and we did, and... Uh, you know, we came up with something. We came up with a, a screenplay within like three, three and a half months, I believe it was. That That is and, amazing. And you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, three and a half months is amazing. Well, I'm yeah, you, I mean, the thoughts it, had already been there. You know, the thoughts had been in there for a long time between both of us, and we didn't realize it until we started writing because all of a sudden, we, like, we structured it out. We had a real... You know, thorough structure. We wanted it to be one week. We wanted him to be created on the first day, kind of physically speaking, and and uh, and travel through that hero's journey. And then we started talking about some of the best moments we had with Harry or people around Harry, and some of the best lines we had heard. You know, in the at three in the morning at you know <laughs> illegal after hours clubs. And pretty soon we had some really great dialogue. And we had this philosophy that Harry had been, you know, kind of pounding into us for decades. And all of a sudden, it was really easy to write. You know, it just, and, you know, you set this over the course, uh, you know, of a week, the Lucky's journey, which I also find, you know, very metaphoric, creation of Earth, seven days, you know, exactly. rest on the end. You know, Jimmy Darren's character of Pauly in the film is absolutely delicious such a delight and he really is 
he he's the man he's the balance he's the one you know between heaven and hell which way do you go and he can lead he can lead lucky through one door or the other depending on uh, what kind of advice lucky wants to listen to and wow. all of that that's really <laughs> that's really into it i mean I, i'll tell you like that's really specific and i'm pretty i'm sure drago i speak for drago too that we're really appreciative of the fact that you you know pointed that out because we did do that specifically we wanted him to be like a gatekeeper and he very much is. And then, of course, John then steps in with Tim and the cinematography and the visuals and the color and bring in the design of Eve's Bar, out back of Eve's Bar, your dark woods, your reds, you know, the, con the red light, the red tones. So you really get that contrast between the beauty of the desert, a fading desert, but still beautiful nonetheless with bright golden sunlight and blue skies, and then the potential darkness and danger of making the wrong choice at, at the end of your life. And it is all, they complement your words so beautifully. So it's a complete oh. synergistic uh, merging, and it just, it just works so well. So well. Well, that's, oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, how how has this film taken on new meaning for you since Harry Dean's passing? I mean, Harry seemed invincible to everybody. Harry's going to be around for another hundred years, another ninety years, like like the the snore tur uh, tortoise that we have in the film, or the cactus. Um, did you you know what does it mean to you now, in retrospect, looking at the film with what has transpired? Well, um, I guess. Go ahead, Logan. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking. I watched it again last night at the ArcLight, and um, there, what I didn't really have a full grasp on when we were doing it, that it's revealed now to me that he's gone, is how much of himself he was really laying bare for us, mm -hmm. and how, and not just physically. You know, his costume is, is his underwear, boots, and a hat for a lot of the movie. <laughs> Um, which we stripped him down bare on purpose. We wanted you to see the element of what he is. Everything in the desert is, I grew up in Arizona, everything in the desert is stripped down to its very basic elements. I mean, even the leaves on the trees have turned to thorns. So that's, Harry is the manifestation of that. And, and what I realized after he's gone now, like watching it last night, that he just, he bared his soul to us yeah. as well. He took, you know, took his costume off and he took all of the uh, the things that we have in, endowed on, or in, by, I guess, endowed on him over the years of his career, he took it all aside and just showed us who he really was. And it, it just strikes me dumb sometimes when I watch this performance and realize that I was standing in the room when he was doing it. And I realized what a, an amazing performance it was at the time, but now that he's gone, it just makes it just haunting, haunting. He knew it. He knew at the time. He didn't. He wasn't sick or anything, but he knew at the time that this was his best. Mm. Oh, without a doubt, this is the performance of of a lifetime. It is rare that we see from anybody a performance like this one in a story like this one, and this truly is the stars aligning for this film to be made at this particular moment in time. And it, I got to tell you, if somebody's going to go out, this is the way to go out with a story this beautiful and a film this well done. Wow. Well, thank you so much for saying yeah. that. And, um, yeah, I'm curious. We're, we were just honored to be able to, pr you know, provide an opportunity for one last rodeo. And we just, but we knew Harry and what he was capable of so that all we had to do was get the best chance we could to get that rodeo on its feet and then let him take over mm -hmm. and we knew it would be successful now for first time feature screenwriters like yourselves i've got to ask you what what did it do to you and you're also producers on the film what ha what what did this do to you when you start seeing your cast take shape you have harry dean you get david lynch 
You've got Ron Livingston. You've got Ed Bagley Jr. You've got Tom Skerritt. You've got Beth Grant. You've got Jimmy Darren. Which, and I don't know if you heard the top of the show, and I told this to uh, John last week when we were interviewing and talking. I interviewed Jimmy a few years ago for a benefit that he was doing. Uh, Unfortunately, he got pneumonia. He didn't do the benefit. But I asked him, I said, Jimmy, the last thing that you did was Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Why don't we see you in front of the camera? He said, because, he goes, the roles aren't there. When the right role comes along, I'll get back in front of the camera. So, obviously, the right role came along because you guys got him back in front of the camera. Yeah, well, I'll just quickly add to that is that, um, <laughs> you know, when we when we started, when the cast started coming around and we folks started jumping the board, uh, I'll speak. I'll speak for myself when I say, like, when we, you know, Harry Dean, David Lynch, like you said, all these people, great people coming aboard. I almost didn't even tell my, even my closest friends, nor did I tell anybody because I just thought, well, that would sound like a complete lie if you told somebody, <laughs> like, yeah, right, you got those. But, you know, it just sounds such a, it's like an all-star team. Um, so, but I, I, you know, I'll let, Logan speak for himself, but I, I was, uh, we, I, you know, I just, I was dumbfounded, and I couldn't, you know, I, I, I you know, when Begley came aboard, obviously we knew that Begley would sort of do it because he's just such a generous soul, and he, mm-hmm. he, great friends, and so there are a couple people that we anticipated would come aboard, but when it started rounding off with everyone else, I mean, uh, I was just completely humbled, and I don't know, Logan can add to that. But. Yeah, well. You know, it was when Harry said yes, it was amazing enough. Um, but you know, when his pal started jumping on board, we got Begley and everybody. All of a sudden, we were like, "This is kind of ridiculous." <laughs> and then when we needed to cast the role of uh, Howard, it was uh, we had this moment of, "Well, let's just swing for the fences." Mm-hmm. Let's, you know, the, who's the number one guy we would want for this role? The answer was David Lynch. So let's swing for the fences and try to get David Lynch. And, you know, I called his assistant. His assistant is an amazing guy, Michael Farrell, and he talked to David. David loves Harry, and he loved the script. And all of a sudden, I hung up my phone, and Drago and I were standing in the kitchen with my dog, Fiona, and Drago goes, so what, what was that? And I go, David Lynch is going to be in our movie. And we stood there in silence for a minute, and then we kind of said it out loud a few times, David Lynch is going to be in our movie. <laughs> and it just it didn't like it was it was like we were talking about two other guys. It was amazing. Oh um, my god! It, yeah, it's just been an amazing personal journey, uh, you know, all along for all of us. And again, the tent pole of all of this is Harry D. Mm-hmm. and I consider him giving me that gift. Yeah, you know, I'm curious for both of you because you're wearing the hats here as screenwriters as producers. What was the learning curve like for you in each of those respective roles? Vertical. Huge. <laughs> there was no curve. It Huge. was vertical. <laughs> yeah. It looked like a like a, uh, um, a cardiologist report or something, up and down and up and down. But, no, I mean, our, well, our learning, we, we had studied scripts and read so many scripts. We were both actors read so many plays and scripts in our lives that telling the story, you know, that was, that kind of came naturally, but getting the movie made, it was, you know, we we were faced with those unknowns that we had no idea existed. And then we had to kind of make the decision in the moment. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was bad, but I guess the good outweighed the bad. Don't you think, Ross? Yeah. I mean, and all credit, all credit to everyone, everyone. I mean, down to, down to uh, Amitra Corey, who was one of, uh, who was one of, who was our production designer, uh, had had asked uh, a dear friend of hers, uh, who was living, I believe, I might get this wrong, but I believe was living in Virginia, mm. and here's a guy that flew out from Virginia to basically sleep on her couch and work for zero pay just to be, just to be a part and get a chance to work with Harry. Um, so I mean, all the way down from from Harry down to that, uh, to, down to the extras even i mean it was everyone had a lot to contribute uh, particularly in the actual physical production with all, all all the producers that came aboard 
everyone. I mean, it was a definitely a team team effort for sure. Well, you know, it might it may escape a lot of people's attention, but you know, one of your main characters in here, it truly is your tortoise, President Roosevelt, is truly a very important character in this film um, that really addre- helps address the the ideas of mortality, and that you know. David Lynch's character of Howard, you know, he's got to worry about President Roosevelt and think about, well, when I'm gone, who's going to take care of him? It's that whole idea of life keeps going on, even though it may be fading like the desert. It, life is still there. There's still a vibrancy. And you've got to worry about that. But you're so specific. And then John was so specific in the casting of President Roosevelt what kind of research did you guys do into the behaviors and lifespan of the desert tortoise and similarly the 1200 year old cactus <laughs> well um i grew up in cave creek that's uh where we shot where we filmed those exterior scenes with all those big saguaros that's literally my backyard not hyperbole. That literally is the backyard of where I live in, in or my parents live in Arizona. I want that backyard. So I, spent the, <laughs> I spent the first 18 years of my life running around that place with my, you know, my dogs and my brother and sister. So the place is, you know, it, it's a very intimate place for me. Um, and every once in a while in, in the desert, in the Sonoran Desert, you would see a desert tortoise. And it's like seeing you know, a rhinoceros or a, or a unicorn or something. They're magical. They're just magical. They're so rare, and they're so autonomous. And it's like they just walk through your yard, and, they ha- and they, they're and they on a mission. They have some place to be. And then they just wander off into this desert, and you can kind of like think about look, watch, looking at a tortoise and then looking up and rack-focusing to this giant desert with nothing out there, and you think, where the heck are they going? How do they live? You know, there's these magical creatures, and I always thought that growing up. Um, and so when it came time to write about about Lucky, we had to bring the tortoise involved for some, you know, because because of for obvious reasons. Um, and then so I knew a lot about that kind of desert tortoise, and it's funny because we had a discussion with our production designers and stuff about what tortoise would look best on film. And a lot of them agreed that there was a uh, there's an African tortoise that's really big and yellow, and it's gorgeous, and it was mm-hmm. like great on film. But ultimately, John and I and Drago were kind of like, well, yeah, but it needs to be true to the moment, you know, in the place mm-hmm. where he's from. So, um, so we made it that that great desert tortoise. I think in real life his name was Stephen or something like that. Well, and I understand that he was very partial to strawberries and strawberry juice. That is That's correct. True. That is correct. There's, I gotta tell you, if you've never spent some time with them, they really are interesting creatures, and they feel, you know, the thing about them too is, like that tortoise was alive before I was born, and most likely it'll be alive a lot long after I'm gone. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, that's part I had of what it. we. The, go ahead, drugs. Oh, sorry. No, I was just. I I had a tortoise. I had one of those uh, African. I believe it's called. They're called salcata tor- salcata salcata tortoises. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, years ago, um, I bought. I, I got one. It was a baby. I think maybe six or seven weeks old. And uh, you know, someone had informed me that they they grow to be you know <laughs> three to four four feet. Uh, uh, and, and, um, and I just thought it started growing uh, very quickly over the years that I had them. And I, I gave them up uh, because I had moved and I gave them to a farm where they, they have all of these um, tortoises. And it just I found them a great home and very, they're very happy. And I'm really satisfied that, that, that he's there. But um, they're, they are really amazing. They're, they're just, you know, but to, to, I guess quickly just to say that that, the, the, the tortoise in the film is what, you know, is what Harry uh, meant to Logan and I. Um, and through the through the character of Howard, I guess uh, that's how we sort of wanted to explain what, what he meant to us, what Harry meant to us. 
Well, I know I I gravitated towards the tortoise. I I like the, both of <laughs> you. I grew up with on the East Coast, uh, Philadelphia, South Jersey, and down in the Pine Barrens, box turtles galore. So always had box oh, turtles. Right. But I also had an alligator snapping turtle that crawled up on my toe as a baby in a lake. So, uh, you know, I have I have great affinity for these creatures. And Logan, I think you said it best with the tortoises going through the desert. They're all very magical. They really are. And and that magic w- is captured in this film. And I I'm so thrilled that you brought in that metaphor of the tortoise into the script. Oh, well, thank you. You know, it, that wanted to make, you know, we, we realized we were going to create this universe, like the, like the story of um, the little prince. He goes to these different planets that are self-contained existing planets, right? And so we knew that we were inventing this, this, um, this universe, and, um, and we, wanted every, we wanted it to have existed for a really long time. So, you know, you'll never see paint that isn't weathered in this movie. Mm. And you'll never see a sign that isn't crooked, you know, because time weathers everything. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you know, our, needless to say, our protagonist was 89 when we shot it. So, um, believe me, that's a hard sell to distributors. <laughs> Turns out people dig it. <laughs> people dig it. Distributors maybe not so much. And I think now the ones that may have turned you down are kicking themselves. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll tell you, I don't want him to do that. I would just like him to see the movie for what it is yeah. and then go, man, that was that was a really nice ride. Thanks, Harry Dean. Yeah, and, and it really is. You know, for all the screenwriters, and I know my audience base out there, we've got a lot of filmmakers, a lot of screenwriters. What is your collaborative style when you're writing a script? Do you sit across from each other, pass pages back and forth, you know, write from different locations and email back and forth? What is your collaborative process? Well, it was just that, as I mentioned earlier. um, um, We 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 wrote this whole this entire script that we wrote. I mean, we wrote in at Logan's house. I mean, Mm. whether it's in the backyard or his kitchen or his living room or in the front porch. I mean. Uh, I don't. I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Logan. I don't think there were any other locations that we were with to write. I mean, that's that was it. We just met at Logan's at uh, at uh, eleven o'clock every day um, for like as I said, and this two is, hours, and we just it, wrote. We should stress too, you know, when you go, oh, well, we met for two day or two hours a day. People are like, well, that's not a lot, but you know, we also had twelve hour day jobs each, so you know that it was a lot. You know, because you start, you know, it, 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 we had to commit to it and be obsessed with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to throw that in, Draga. Oh, I think that's yeah. an important thing to throw in because, as we all know, almost anybody when they're starting out in in the business, you know, everybody's got they start with those bartender and, and waiter waitress jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's right. It's their survival gigs and. They're important in this biz- in the world that they exist, and we can do them. But but that said, they should be you know for us we wanted it to be a means to an end, despite the fact that we're still probably we're both kind of doing it still. But <laughs> but that said, um, we we were religious about doing it, and we had to hold each other accountable. And that's what you know if you can do that for yourself, more power to you. But it's so much easier if you're writing on your own. You work twelve hours, you come home, you want to see your wife, your husband, or whomever, and pet your dog and so much easier to not to not do it and then all of a sudden where you know what are your priorities in life Mm -hmm. you you because you're they've already been set you're now considering everything else other than writing more important and we held each other accountable to make writing the script important um and then the actual process of writing basically we kind of come up with the scene we knew the characters and then i would kind of act out the scenes and and uh (laughs) try Drago would add dialogue, and we would kind of edit it down, but I, he would be behind the computer, because um, I can't type very well, and uh, I would basically pretend and act to play all the parts, and he would be the director. It was amazing. So look at that. You got to play a turtle, a tortoise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's funny. I'll tell you, I, 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 we should really 
give kudos to John Carroll Lynch, our director, because those those shots that you're talking about with President Roosevelt, those we, we described them exactly the way they shot them. You wow. know, we framed the shot. We we wrote the frame of the shot, and we wrote exactly what we wanted the tortoise to be doing. And in and, and almost every case throughout the whole movie, and in fact, some people read it and were like, "There's no way you guys are going to get this movie bought." and made unless you guys make it because the script isn't written for somebody to interpret it's mm-hmm. written for somebody to do mm-hmm. how exciting so, and that was really a testament to john carroll lynch to his directing skill and ability to to talk to us and and collaborate in a way that we all thought was you know mutually beneficial how fluid were you uh with the script once shooting started were there changes? Did you guys all pretty much stay to the script as was written? How was that process for you? Because I'm thinking, you know, okay, you've also got your producing hats on, so sometimes you got to make those tough calls and tough decisions about, okay, we're running late, we need to cut this scene, you know, things like that. Well, there were definitely well, uh, scenes that we ended up not shooting mm-hmm. um, for... Because for some, we thought that they were superfluous, that we didn't need it. We didn't need it to tell the story. It didn't expand Lucky's universe. It was, you know, it was, we thought the dialogue was great, but, the, you know, you got to sacrifice the dialogue if it doesn't get you anywhere. Um, so, and that said, Harry didn't argue, but you had to, you had to justify every word that came out of his mouth. <laughs> Um, even the stuff that sounded improv, he, you know, it was written, we talked about it, and he, we had to justify the reason he was saying it. And if there's no reason for him to say it, Lucky wouldn't say it. He just wouldn't do it. So, Yeah, um, yeah. Um, there's, you know, the, I, I guess maybe that, that's a, a very high compliment. As Logan mentioned, we're improvised, and we, at a lot of these Q&As that we've been having, um, people had asked, you know, how much of it was improvised, and I, I, I said, take it as a very sweet compliment because none of it was improvised. Um, there might have been, I think, even John said the other night, I think there might have been like four words or something were that were improvised. Wow. But for the most of all of it was, you know, written, and um, so, um, you know. Um, yeah, it was. It was as as Logan said, as as being honest and and, and being real and and uh, you know you have to. Harry would Harry would you know would question certain things and I've never acted opposite Harry Dean Stanton. Although running lines with him, you could arguably say it's like acting because <laughs> you have to be present, you have to be there, you have to be in the moment. And when writing a script now, particularly for someone like Harry, you better be real because. And you better be honest, because Harry is gonna—he'll call you on it. He'll—he'll, he'll, you know, he'll—he'll uh, <laughs> he'll call you out. <laughs> well, and then you also have—I I don't know if it's an added benefit, a uh, help or a hindrance. You also have David Lynch on hand, writer, director. Do, did he afford you the? Did he give you any input, any insight uh, into? developing his character of Howard. Uh, I'm curious how that works. Because sometimes when you have a director who comes on set, not often, but there are some that they want to insert their methodology into somebody else's production, or they have their ideas. Was Did anything like this happen? Or was David just as collaborative as, you know, everybody else? Oh, I'll tell you, uh, there, it was nobody more prepared than David Lynch when he came on the set. He, he was he not, you know, not just prepared to do the scene, but he had done his background. Like, he had come up with a part of a backstory and who he was in this three-dimensional, four-dimensional world. It was amazing to see. And he was not a director that day. He was an actor. And mm-hmm. he was so true and loyal to being part of the collaborative team. I can, like... You know, if they, in terms of, uh, you know, if you scaled it from one to ten of how, you know, wonderful a collaborator he is, I'd put it at an eleven. You know, it was one more because he just, he was beautiful and he worked with Harry Dean and he was really patient because Harry had a lot of words to get through. Mm-hmm. So it, 
just beautifully. The only thing that he brought drugs, and you can uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, I think we shot the second scene first, and he came in and well, he came from wardrobe and he had a hat on, and uh, that white hat. And he, John Lynch goes, so David, maybe we should take the hat off for the scene. And he and David goes, no, if I take the hat off, they'll recognize me. And he wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. It's funny. He was being real because, you know, his persona is that amazing look. He's always in a suit. Mm-hmm. His hair is coiffed. You know, he is yeah. He's an icon. He's, he's an icon of David Lynch. So he understood how the, the public saw him and perceived him, and he understood that if he came in with a hat and a tie undone, that he could be understood or he could be believed as Howard. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a, a true insight as to somebody who knows how to tell a story and who knows himself. Wow. Um, he, he was completely... Yeah, cool he was completely... Just, what was that, sorry. Drago? No, I just said he was I was just going to say that, yeah, David Lynch was couldn't have been more respectful, uh, more professional. I mean, just came in as an actor that day. That was it. 100%. Total actor. The, uh, and the only... Uh, the only advice I ever got from him in that day, or on that day, was, or those days... We were all stand, sitting outside around their trailers, and Harry and he were smoking, and uh, we were all running lines, and it's that last scene where Harry's doing a monologue about facing the truth of the universe. Mm-hmm. And Harry said, so where am I coming from to, for this? And I was telling him, and Drago and I were both there re- reassuring him, and we were saying, look, you're, you're searching for this. It's as if these words are coming to you, and this thought is coming to you as you're saying it. Kind of like you know, like you're reading a thing because it's yourself discovering it and saying it at the same time. And David Lynch interrupted and goes, uh, "Guys, Logan, can I, can I just maybe add a, one thing?" And then we said, "Absolutely, absolutely." <laughs> and David goes, "Harry, you're not, you're searching for the words, but you're not searching for the ideas. The ideas have been there your whole life, and you've known they're there." But you're searching for the words, and they're coming to you correctly in this moment. So you're discovering them as it happens, but you know the idea. It's familiar. And we all stood there in silence, and Harry goes, well, what do you think? And I just stood there in silence for a minute, and then I looked at him, and I went, I'm going to go with David Lynch on this one. Like, you know, when, when you get that kind of beautiful, specific advice, he was dead on. He was absolutely right. He knew that moment better than we did, and we wrote the thing. Oh, my God. Well, you know, yeah. as, you, as you both sit here now, the film is out there in the world. Audiences are loving it. Critics are loving it. Um, I've got to ask you, each of you, what did you each learn about yourself in the process of making Lucky? that you can now and will take with you into your next and future projects? Well, I I guess I could start off. I would say, you know, obviously you learn about your strengths and your weaknesses uh, in all facets of of filmmaking, uh, whether it be the writing or the actual physical production, as we spoke about earlier. Um, You know, that... um, I, but what I do know, since you know Logan and I, as you asked earlier too, but writing the screenplay, it's uh, given that was this was our you know first time collaborating in a screenplay writing together. I, uh, you know, you have like I'm sure any writer, you have uh, you know some days you wake up and you you look at the script and you meet and you think, man, is this any good? Is this this is we should just stop, you know, maybe this isn't good. You start, you have those self doubts. And then some days you're like, man, this is great. I can't, this is going to be fantastic. Um, but I guess, uh, uh, what I personally learned as far as when it comes to the writing, you know, is not to just, not to question yourself, just go with it, throw it on the page. And if it's honest, it's going to work. You know, if it seems forced, it's probably not going to work. Um, um, I, I don't know. I, I, there are many, many things. I like Logan take take the rest of it. But well, you you said well, something well. just now, man. That you said something just now that is so ringing true, and I'm so glad you said it so many times. Which was just put it on the page. You know, we can edit it later. Um, you know, cut it down later, but get all the words out. Like when we wrote that monologue, that, that Howard Portis monologue, it was it was obviously longer than that. 
and but because we, we wanted to get all the thoughts out, and then you know, then you go back through. And, okay, well, here's the through line. What's superfluous? What are you keeping in because it's pretty, and what what aren't you keeping in should be there. And I think that's the big one. One of the biggest things I learned was that was to throw it on the page. He's like Drago said, best advice. He's he's one of the best things he's ever given me. Um, and, and then and, the other thing then, is. Well, I would just say the other thing I learned was get out of your own way. You know, we both have a tendency to self-sabotage. <laughs> and, and you know, and it's just life. Sometimes you're maybe subconsciously afraid of success and you want to blow the whole thing up. And, uh, and, and you know, it's uh, it, you can't do it. You know, you, you can't do it. you got to get out of your own way and let somebody else do it. So that's my son Stanton in the background. Aww. And, and- I'll just quickly, I just wanted to quickly add, I just thought what just Logan said, you know, also at the same time, you know, I, I, what I learned is that, what I've learned is that, uh, you know, it, in this day and age, with you know, with all the tense pole films of, you know, superhero movies and all that, and that's great, and entertainment's great, but, you know, I when we started writing this, I was, I was, I, w- I was very scared when we were writing this because I thought that maybe, not that no one would understand the film, but I was—I I thought secretly somewhere, I thought that, you know, people wouldn't care, that people wouldn't care about movies like this, you know, they're, they're um, and this, I'm not, you know, this is not sounding like an ego trip or anything, but I, you know, what, I believe what we have is, is important, and particularly now with the, even the events of what happened last night, in Las Vegas, to mm-hmm. everything going on in the world, like I think this is this is an, an important film, and it's something that we all have in common, no matter what race we are, no matter what age we are. It's something that we're all going to have to to face. And as my friend Hugo, who's actually in the movie, plays Vincent, the bartender, he said to me one time, goes, "You know, I think this is this is an important thing in the world, and it's it's going to help people." Uh, and with the risk of sounding like, you know, again, like I'm on some sort of an ego trip, I just, I really believe that this is a, it's a good, honest movie, and and we're we're we we've, we've got something that's important and 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 beautiful and lovely, and and yeah, it's Harry Dean Stanton, uh, and and God love Harry, and uh, you know, uh, a privilege to have to have known him, um, and at the same time, you know, let's not forget up there. It's, take away Harry Dean Stan. That's a 90 year old man on, on screen acting. And that, that alone is a, is a, is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I don't of, know where I was going with that. And, and of course all the issues in Lucky, everything that Lucky faces, everything he ponders, everything his friends help him to see is something that each and every one of us will face at some point in our lives. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you really, you, you know, that's, that's the truth. I mean, the fear that you're going to, you know, Harry says that you never get out, you know, nobody gets out of this alive. And it's, it's how you, you recognize that moment, I guess, is because it's going to happen anyway, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, that's when we start the movie with the definition of realism, they, you know, accepting the situation for what it is, and being prepared to deal with it accordingly, yeah. you know. And for us, being prepared to deal with the void or the end accordingly means that you don't let fear dictate the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's terrifying. But, you know, just like that monologue Tom Skerritt gives, you know, you can, there is a moment to summon beauty and to summon joy. And, you know, you can be facing a, an onslaught and and still be able to do that, I guess. I mean, I I have never been, I have faced those moments of terror. um, And I'll be honest with you, they they hit me like a truck. Mm -hmm. You know, I have not been able to be able to to do this yet. I'm writing about a thing that I aspire to do. Well, gentlemen, you, you have aspired, you have achieved, and you have delivered one of the most beautiful films of the year. Um, this, this is, it, it is a very special film, the messaging within it, the metaphor within it, this is life. And 
you sit there and you watch and you walk out of the theater and you reflect. And not a lot of films can say that. So uh, just a beautiful job to both of you. Oh, well, well, thank, thank you so, so much. Well, and, and thank you for your time. Yeah. Oh, guys, a pleasure. Andy. You'll come back on the show Thanks. again soon, I hope. Absolutely. Sure. Well, we're working. You know, we have we have a western we're working on with a whole different set of values and themes. So, uh, um, when when we have that uh, uh, on the ground running, we'll come back and, and let you know about All it. All right. And and yeah. I guess I could just quickly say, just to, you know, out of this whole, this entire conversation we just had, I guess as a from a producer's standpoint, you know, if you, you please go see the movie. Uh, it's important because movies like this that don't have, you know, that, uh, you know, thank God Magnolia is on board with this film and they're distributing it and they're doing a wonderful hell of a job. Mm-hmm. They, just, they, they couldn't, ha- they couldn't, couldn't be more happier um, to have found a home with them. And um, yeah. And know, the truth the is they really media, like the movie. Those, e- those individual people at Magnolia, each one of them really like the movie. Yep. And that's, you know, that's what matters. Um but we need, yeah. But like Drago said, we need you to go and actually see it. We, you know, I saw it this weekend at the ArcLight Hollywood, and I was looking at the marquee and every other movie there. I bet you they spent more on craft service and pop tarts than we spent on their whole film. That's not yep. hyperbole, you know. So when it means like two more tickets sold, that matters. Yes, it absolutely does. And uh, go ahead, Drago. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, and if you're living in a city or a town somewhere where the movie's not showing, call the local theater and tell them that you'd like to see it. And, you know, they, they'll always, they'll always, I'm sure, reach out to Magnolia and the people there and um, try to get it in the theater. So uh, it's in the website, www.luckythefilm.com. And let me ask, because uh, for all of our international listeners, and yes, we do. Do you know that 3% of our live listeners are in Italy? So how's, hey. how's that for trivia uh, today? Um, hey, well, Jim, our first AD is uh, named Lorenzo Grasso, and he, he's from <laughs> Italy, and it's the most amazing first AD we've ever worked with. Do we have so inter- we, we, international release plans? Yeah, um, we, it's going to sure be did. unfolding throughout. Oh, go ahead, Draga. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's, it's going to be unfolding here in the next couple of months. Okay. Um, I believe it hits the UK right before Christmas or right out right in that area and uh and throughout Europe and uh and Asia as well. I believe it's going to uh, dozens of different markets that they've already sold. So uh and then in America I believe it comes online and all that kind of thing at the beginning near the beginning of the year. Oh, fabulous. Yes, I'm so glad we have international distribution on this as well cuz we've got uh Two Chinese outlets that actually pick up the video of Behind the Lens every week. So it'll be over there. But uh, our live listening audience, I know we've got uh, a contingent in Italy, uh, in Moscow, and uh, oh, through wow. yeah, and throughout Europe. So yeah, so well, every- that's wonderful. And what it's interesting you say that because you know Drago and I have had this discussion for. 15 years about the movie Paris, Texas, and how it's it's a it's a movie about America and Americana. However, it's it's really from the eye of a European. You know, mm-hmm. Vim Vendors directed it, it, even though it was written by Sam Shepard, an American. Vim Vendors, it was his eyes that captured it, and we really talked about Lucky being that ilk of a film that we didn't want it to be just America. Heck yeah. You know, we wanted it to be the the grittiness of, of what America really is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just the American dream. What happens after that? Yeah. Well, um, and that's a very European way to look at things, I think. And I, I, I really appreciate that kind of a filmmaker's um, mantra. Well, unfortunately, we are actually all out of time today, guys. So... I look, oh, for, I look forward to talking to you both again in the future. And in the meantime, everybody, go see Lucky. And I'm going to sign off the show with both of you. I'm Debbie Elias, and this is Behind the Lens.